to see so many of you uh, interested in, in the case of North Macedonia, please uh, welcome with me the Prime Minister of North Macedonia, Dimitar Kovacevsky. Welcome to Vienna. And please uh, welcome as warmly the chairwoman of the Social Democratic Party, Dr. Pamela Rendi Wagner. Uh, we are here uh, only the hosts of this event. It's organized mainly by the Friede Heber Stiftung and by the Arena Institute, but we are happy to be the host because the Diplomatic Academy has a long and actually trusted uh, tradition of working with the Balkan countries. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, we had many of your colleagues from the Western Balkan countries here. We had also as, as a speaker your president, Mr. Bendarovsky, here, and students of the academy went to Skopje also uh, to meet him in his residence there. Uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, well, the last politicians were the president of Kosovo, but also the prime minister of Kosovo. Uh, I could go on and on. And this is because uh, not only for Austria, but especially for this place. The Western Balkans are part of Europe and a close part of Europe. Uh, we used to say in Austria, the Balkans are the home market. I don't like the expression. They are in our heart, in the home of, 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 of Central Europe and Southeastern Europe. Market issues are important, but actually this is a cultural, this is an emotional thing that we are close together. And uh, when the Prime Minister of Slovakia was here on Wednesday, he said he feels at home at this place. And that's not only because Bratislava is only 55 kilometers away. So believe me that I'm very happy that you agreed to come here. We hope that the title of your talk is right, that there is a new start a new impetus. Uh, we would need it in Europe because of the Russian war that's going on and that we need to find stability again. Uh, and let's talk to our French friends, to our Spanish friends, to convince them that enlargement uh, is a thing necessary, not only because of the given situation, but because you are part of Europe. So welcome from my side. Dear Honorable Prime Minister Kovacevsky, dear Honorable Chairwoman Sreni Wagner, dear Ambassador Brix, yes. <laughs> uh, dear Ms. Malchnik, dear Ms. Fenkart, uh, distinguished guests, it is my sincere pleasure to open this event on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And thank you again, dear Prime Minister, to, uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedule on a national holiday in North Macedonia, if I may add. Uh, to come here uh, to Vienna and speak to us today. Uh, the topic, how to regain momentum or to regain the momentum in EU enlargement um, after the devastating vetoes from France and Bulgaria, we just mentioned, is the crucial one that both captivates and sometimes captures the daily politics in Skopje. It's how to enable North Macedonia to return to the old bargain um, reforms for progress. As I'm very much looking forward uh, to your uh, Prime Minister's remarks on your strategy, initi initiatives and instruments for the way forward in North Macedonia's EU integration, it is important not to forget what a burden has been placed on the shoulders of your government. North Macedonia, like no other of the EU candidates, has been at the mercy of this union's uh, state, member states, domestic agendas and politics. So whilst the emphasis on reforms in good governance, anti-corruption, social and ecological standards is the correct one, it is equally important to highlight the role of EU and its member states and what they can do to promote uh, the, the course uh, of your government of in EU integration. Therefore, I'm very happy that we have the chance today to discuss the, the second aspect of the invitation today. How can Austria and Austrians and European Social Democrats support North Macedonia's European path? How can the EU overcome its loss of credibility in the region? And uh, it was already mentioned by the Ambassador Briggs, after the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine last year and this new geopolitical setting that we find ourselves in on the European continent, it is in my view, of the utmost importance to regain this trust that has, been, that has been lost and restore the credibility both in North Macedonia but also in the wider region in South, uh, Southeast Europe. Because trust and credibility that are so essential for these international agreements 
like the one that uh, was brokered last year, that always require a certain leap of faith. In other words, uh, and on the risk of oversimplification, don't ask what North Macedonia can do for the EU, but what the EU can do for North Macedonia. To have this discussion, I cannot think of a better venue than the Diplomatic Academy here in Vienna. And thank you very much again for hosting us. And I would like to thank our partners from the Renner Institute, um, in particular Gerd Machel and Maria Malchnik, and the International Institute for Peace, Stephanie Fenkart, for their initiative and fruitful cooperation. And of course, again, thank you again for the Diplomatic Academy for hosting us. I wish us all a good event, a good talk, fruitful discussion, and uh, thank you very much again for joining. Thank you. So may Hello, everybody, dear Prime Minister, Ambassador Briggs, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. For me personally, it's really a great pleasure today to welcome you here in Vienna and um, on the occasion of this very important event, starting the accession talks with North Macedonia. And uh, the honor is even greater since it's with you we have this uh, event, with you, Mr. Prime Minister. And let me start. Um, by thanking, of course, the organizers, the Renner Institute here in Austria, but also the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung office in Skopje, who were the organizers, the initiators of this very important um, event today, of these talks today. Um, and let me tell you that your work, your efforts in and for North Macedonia and the whole region is of utmost political importance. Thanks for this. Um, many thanks also for the host today here, the Diplomatic uh, Academy. Thanks a lot, Emil Briggs. Um, and I'm not too sure um, that all of you know uh, the quite social democratic relationship also of this place, um, which was refounded after the war by our biggest social democrat, uh, Bruno Kreisky. It was refounded after the war, first as a consular academy, um, a consular academy, and later on as the diplomatic uh, academy. And at that time, um, Bruno Kreisky had his big, big efforts uh, within the foreign uh, politics since he was minister of foreign affairs. And his aim was not, not only to modernize and um, to modernize the education of future diplomats in Austria, but also to enable financially less well-off students uh, to prepare for an international career. And since, it, since his early days, um, Kreisky had a clear vision. He had a clear vision of a modern, a social, a democratic Austria as an active member of the international community, of course, an Austria which is committed to peace, an Austria which is committed to reconciliation in conflict areas um, internationally. As we all know, the times have changed since then, politically and beyond, but Kreisky's vision, I dare to say, is still relevant for all of us. What would his vision be today with regard to Southeast Europe? I'm quite sure he would definitely, definitely support that um, the Southeast Europe is part of the European Union. Definitely. Committed to peace and reconciliation. A Southeast Europe which is committed to democracy, rule of law and human rights, with fair and just societies, socially and economically strong, of course, well connected internationally, committed to climate and environmental protection. And for me, actually, the most important, we talked about young generations in North Macedonia already, Mr. Prime Minister, with young generations who see their prosperous future in and not outside the region. However, we are all aware of the fact that the Western Balkans road from vision to reality has been a bumpy one, a very bumpy one. One with many detours and uh, diversions, with conflicts and arguments, with false promises and hope. Nevertheless, since 2017, and this was the decisive year, since 2017, the country made really great efforts. And they don't grow on trees, as we say in an Austrian uh, saying. Um, made great, great efforts in order 
to be able to start the accession talks and to become a full member of the European Union. And let me ensure you, Mr. Prime Minister, the Austrian Social Democratic Party honestly supports the quickest possible resumption of North Macedonian succession talks. No doubt about that. We support the accession uh, as soon as the negotiation talks have been, or the, have been ended or have come to a positive end. You can count on our full support. EU enlargement in the Western Balkans, and we've heard a lot about that already, is an overarching goal in Austria. There are many reasons for this, and let me point out only a few. Some have been mentioned already. We are very close. I mean, geographically, we are very, very close um, countries. We share a common history. We are connected by strong human ties. More than 25,000 North Macedonians live and work in Austria. There are strong economic interdependencies, and since you are a professor of economic, you know, and you worked also um, there, you know how strong these ties are, and they are becoming ever closer. Austria and in, Austrian companies belong to the biggest investors in the last few years in North Macedonia, and this is a good development, and I hope this to be prolonged. And Austria can only benefit for prosperous, uh, from a prosperous progressive and democratic Southeast Europe. For Austria, it's a win-win-win situation. Yet, I need to stress uh, the word democratic, democratic Western Balkan. Indeed, it is with great concern that we observe a certain anti-democratic development all across Europe. Democracy is under pressure in Europe. This is a problem, and also in some Western Balkan countries, and we are confronted with sad backlashes in the last years in democracy, rule of law, and also in the field of human rights. However, I'm full of trust, Mr. Prime Minister, that under your political leadership, North Macedonia is and will remain committed to democracy, to the rule of law, and of course to human rights. I fully trust also in your commitment to the European future of your country and the whole region. Let me wish North Macedonia all success possible for this very important European endeavor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Prix, René Schlee, and Pamela Rendi Wagner. My name is Maria Malchnik. I'm the director of the Karl Renner Institute, and it's a great pleasure for me to, in a couple of moments, uh, invite the Prime Minister of the Republic of North Macedonia up on the stage to give his lecture. The Karl Renner Institute has been involved in many progressive projects in the Western Balkans for a very long time. Therefore, we are, we are and we always have been keen on tightening our relationship with both uh, progressive civil society initiatives and, of course, social democratic parties and leaders in the region. Pamela Rendi-Wagner already outlined why we consider Prime Minister Kovacevsky and his Social Democratic Party as outstanding examples of how, with good governance, the region has every potential to join the European Union as very valuable members. The last time a Northern Macedonian Prime Minister spoke at the Karl Renner Institute, it was your predecessor, Soran Saev, in October 2019. And this was, uh, I think, the day right after the EU General Affairs Council once more couldn't agree on starting the negotiations with uh, North, North Macedonia and Albania on uh, EU accession. And I remember that then, this day, when Soran Saev was at the Renner Institute, we were so disappointed, like everybody was so disappointed um, at this moment, as there was kind of a now or never feeling. And we, um, were, we were afraid that it will be the never <laughs> in the end. But now we know it was not a now or never, but it was a not now but soon. Uh, moment as the ne negotiations finally started last year, which is a, a very, very good development. Progress has certainly been made, but it, um, it demanded a lot 
from the Republic of North Macedonia. So let's hear from uh, Prime Minister Dimitar Kovacevsky about your, gover your government strategy for your country's path in the EU. The floor is yours. I'm going to start as yesterday. Ihre Exzellenzen, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren. Um, I am very, ich freue mich, heute hier zu sein. And uh, I will continue in English. It's going to be safer. <laughs> that uh, I'm very happy that today I am here at this renewed Diplomatic Academy in Vienna, the Vienna School of International Studies, which is a top center of knowledge in the field of international affairs and one of the oldest and most prestigious professional schools in the world. On this occasion, because today is also a big day for our Muslim friends and colleagues, uh, to all of them who celebrate, may God bless them and their families with happiness for the day of Ramadan. I see many friends here because with Vienna, I am connected and politically and professionally. My first uh, experience in international politics was back in 1999, when I was part of the uh, international team of students and volunteers that were part of the electoral headquarters of the Social Democratic Party of Österreich at the time when Viktor Klima was uh, competing on the elections with Wolfgang Schiesel and Jörg Haider in 1999. So this was really an experience, staying at the Altmansdorf Hotel, Madam President will remember, and uh, going a few blocks from here in the headquarters of SPO. And then the second tie is with uh, my experience working in the industry. So I spent quite a time on the Rennwegstrasse in uh, the very beautiful glassy ship type of uh, building where we were preparing the magenta strategies for the southeastern Europe. And then I moved a few bezirks down to work with the Telecom Austria group. So when I come to Vienna, actually I come to a very well-known city and many people which I know. And even today, I see people which are really improving the times, the, the ties between Austria and North Macedonia. Here with us is, I can see the president of the Macedonian Austrian business community, Mr. Vinci, a very well-known uh, businessman who is coming from the beautiful city of Struga, his family, and now he is a very renewed businessman in uh, Vienna. Also, I see my friend, Mr. Krastevsky, who comes from a very beautiful and small town of Khrushchev, from where actually my grandmother comes. And I see also many other familiar faces here. Uh, top diplomats and politicians have passed through these corridors, and among them, almost 30 years ago, even that he is still young, back in 1994, was our current ambassador to Vienna, Mr. and His Excellency, Oswit Rosoklia. Uh, he is one of our finest ambassadors and one of the best ambassadors in our diplomatic network. And it's really an asset to have diplomats for a small country as we are that have studied at this prestigious school. I would like to thank the Renner Institute and the Friedrich Ebert Foundation for the invitation and Dr. Blix for the warm welcome to this wonderful home of science and knowledge. As a professor, this presence and disquisition today has a special meaning for me. For the past five years, North Macedonia has been bearer of positive political flows and processes, not only in the Western Balkans, but also in Europe. The government led by the Social Democratic Union of Macedonia 
made maximum political efforts to become a member of NATO and start accession negotiations with the European Union. And I can fully agree with what Madam Wagner said, what the director of Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in Skopje said, what Mr. Blix said about all the challenges we had on the road to become members of NATO and to start the negotiations with the European Union. And challenges you solve with ratio and with both to make decisions. So this is how you do it. The government led by SDSM made maximum political efforts to become a member of NATO and start accession negotiations with the European Union. As a responsible government and ruling party, we managed to solve the most difficult political issue, such as economy and security, which kept the country in uncertainty for decades. By resolving the dispute with the Republic of Greece, and signing the PRESPA agreement, we achieved one of the two strategic goals of our country. We become member of NATO. With that, we managed to ensure lasting peace and strengthen the sovereignty of the state. And we did not stop there. We continued with the integration policies, always putting the welfare of our citizens at the state first. As a government, we have shown strong political will and the sincere desire for concrete progress in European integration. These historic, historic st steps, PRESPA, and the good neighborly relations agreement with Bulgaria were the stepping stones of the fulfillment of our strategic state's goals. They were not the detriment of our culture, they were not the detriment of our identity or our language. Not only that we strengthened them, but we also reaffirmed and confirmed them all around the world. North Macedonia's international standing improved as a result of its NATO membership in terms of politics, security, economy, and finances. Entry into the alliance was not only a guarantee of peace and stability for North Macedonia, but also a guarantee for the Macedonian economy, for the citizens, and for our overall development. Foreign direct investments in crisis conditions reached a record historical amount of 753 million euros only in one year, in the most crisis year of in Europe after the Second World War. So it proves that the improved security, the great relations with the neighbors, work for the economy. Our foreign direct investments are at the highest level in the most crisis year. And they are twice as high as they were in 2016. Investors who come to the country stay and expand their businesses, increase the number of employees, and create added value for our economy. Just two days ago, one of the biggest producers of chips for the automotive industry, for the airlines, medical industry, Internet of Things, from Taiwan, decided to open 205 million euros worth production facility with 4,000 employees in North Macedonia. So this is a proof of concept. When you make the right decisions, then it pays off for the citizens in every sense. Because who could have imagined that in North Macedonia will be produced chips and semiconductors for the automotive and 
aviation industry just five years ago. We also support the development of domestic companies with a record payment of 23 million euros to support the investments of Macedonian companies, 410 of them only in one year. By taking statesmanship decisions, we ensured European and world recognition of the Macedonian language, of the Macedonian identity, which would have made all our ancestors proud. Currently, the Macedonian language is official not only in the United Nations and in NATO, but also in the European Union. Furthermore, the Council of the European Union adopted the decision to sign the agreement on border management between the European Union and the Republic of North Macedonia, or better known colloquially as Frontex, in the Macedonian language without any additions or footnotes as it was in the past requested by some parties. With the start of accession negotiations with the European Union, North Macedonia now has a record realization of capital investments paid from the budget, which sends a signal about the reliability of the legal, tax, administrative, and the overall business climate in the country. Last year, we had a record realization of the capital investments of 465 million euros infrastructure investments, which is 60% more than they were in 2015. In the last three years alone, in conditions of health, economic, and energy crisis, the value of capital investments in the country, in infrastructure, amounted to 1.1 billion euros, including 44 express roads, main and regional roads, which were built or rehabilitated in this period of time. From 2017 to 2022, 1 billion euros have been invested in the construction and rehabilitation of the roads. The construction of the railway corridor, eight, an investment worth 600 million euros has begun. I have said several years ago, as being part of the business community, and I just recently saw on YouTube my interview of 2018, a country which is in the center of the Balkans. If it does not have infrastructure, a road and railway infrastructure, it can only be a roundabout. But if it builds a highway infrastructure, a railway infrastructure, then it can be a crossroad on the Balkans. Historically, due to political reasons, North Macedonia had only the Corridor 10. We never had the Corridor 8. So that's why the country was able only to commute with the Thessaloniki port. With the construction of the Corridor 8 towards Bulgaria and towards Albania, we will be able to use the Burgas and the Dures ports. This will economically improve the country and it will make it important not only for the region of South Eastern Europe, but also for the whole continent of Europe. And that is why we started the two major road infrastructure projects in our nation, which is Corridor 8 and Corridor 10D. And the value of the agreement for the construction of the both corridors is 1.3 billion euros for the next five years. They have also economic value, besides the political and regional value, and strategic value. These investments, which I just mentioned, will have a positive impact on the GDP growth of plus 2% every year for the country. So instead having a GDP growth on an average of 2 to 2.5%, as they were in the past 30 years, the GDP growth will be on the level 
of 4.5 to 5 percent in the years to come. And this is what the people of the country expect and deserve. This construction of the corridors means connecting the country with other European countries. It means foreign investments. It means economic development of the country, faster transfer of people and goods, develop tourism, and above all, above all safe and reliable roads for the citizens. As a nation, we are now connected to the west and to the east for the first time rather than only the north and south, as I said. And it was not easy because in European Union, the corridor 8 was never on the list of the pan-European corridors. Now, in this geostrategic momentum in Ukraine, with the Nord Stream 1 and 2 not working, with Druzhba not working, everyone realized that the corridor 8, that the flow south to the north of LNG gas, of Azerbaijanian gas, now becomes important. And that is why I was always saying, and I will continue to say, that the Western Balkans is inherent part of Europe. Because the pipelines will not go now from east to the west. They will go from south to the north and from west to the east. This will be the new reality in Europe. With our policies, we have shown that we are firmly committed to the Euro-Atlantic path and are an example country that builds the progress of the state and the multi-ethnic society with understanding, negotiations and compromise. North Macedonia complies with the values of the European family with its policies, security aspects and economic development. The management of the budget the management of the European financial support is a huge responsibility and it requires clear strategies which will enable resilience and recovery of both citizens and companies. Confirmation of our serious approach to European funds is that the government led by SDSM in the period from 2017 to 2022 has concluded 2000 363 contracts for financial support for various projects in building infrastructure on state or local level in an approximation of 100 million euros per year. We are also the only government so far in the country that has planned funds and fully use the money from the EPART funds of the European Union for development of the agriculture. Last year, we invested 100% of the available funds, and this year the European Union increased for 60% the funds for North Macedonia, a country which spent the highest amount which was dedicated among all the candidate countries, and even more than some of the member countries taken in percentage comparisons. North Macedonia has also succeeded in unblocking the road to Europe, joining NATO and creating an open Balkans together with Serbia and Albania that puts North Macedonia in a completely different position than it was five years ago. As a responsible government, we also adopted a new energy development strategy until 2040, which is completely based on the European Green Deal. And we are already implementing this strategy in our country. Our priority is the energy transition and independence. The region of Southeastern Europe is dominantly and historically connected to the Russian sources of energy, as was also a big part of Central Europe, and also Austria was in this position. In crisis conditions, we managed 
to contribute to increasing interest in investments in renewable energy. And in about a year, until March 31st this year, since the first day of the mandate of my government, we have 192 megawatts of renewable energy capacities installed and put it on network. For a country of 1.8 million people, this is really a big energy producing capacity from renewables. In 15 months, our regulatory committee for energy has issued 400 licenses for building power plants from renewable energy sources. And this, what has been installed, allow for the fulfillment of the energy requirements of 76,000 Macedonian households, or those with an average consumption of 10 Macedonian cities. The energy capacities which we installed in one year and few months. Our goal is very clear, full membership in the European Union. This is the goal which we will reach on the European road, which I know will not be easy. There will be tough decisions as they were in the past. And sometimes these decisions which you make, people get on a very emotional basis, and they are right. The feelings which we had as Macedonians making the decisions in the past years to make an agreement with Greece, to make an agreement with Bulgaria, to have the vetoes from member states of the European Union were not an easy feelings. This was, this was a very tough and unpleasant feeling for my citizens. And I share these feelings. And when you make these decisions, then you have one feeling which my Macedonian citizens had, and I shared the same feeling. It is a feeling like somebody is cutting with a knife through your stomach. This is a feeling which I had and which my citizens, fellow Macedonians, had when we were making these decisions. But making these decisions will make a better future for our current and next generations. Because as a politician, you cannot hide behind the people and behind the public opinion. You have to have a vision and you have to have a courage to make today decisions that will ensure a better future for the next generations. The Macedonian citizens want to live in the European Union. The European Union is not a goal for itself. It's a goal of a better standard, goal of a better salaries. Compare the salary levels in the countries which were not members of the European Union, and after that, when they became members of the European Union. And this is what our citizens deserve. And that is why we have to make these decisions. And our citizens deserve to live in a member country of the European Union, but their country, not Macedonia. And then not to live in a member country, member of a European Union, but somebody else's country. They deserve to live in member country, North Macedonia, and not to go in Italy, France, or like here in Austria, in Germany. But they deserve to live in a European Union member country, North Macedonia. Only through this kind of decisions and politics and actions, we can provide, provide our citizens with better living standard, effective and efficient judiciary, 
better economic progress, social justice, and supreme democracy. Every road is difficult in itself, and I just explained it. But the work does not scare us, because our great reward will be satisfied citizens and the full member state in the European Union. Let our citizens and future generations live in the European Union. Proud to be Macedonians, with their heads held high, with Macedonian language and identity. In the past period, the European Union have shown that it believes in us. And this happened at most after the war started in Ukraine. And as a country, we fully aligned our foreign policy with the European Union, even that we are not members of the European Union. So our foreign policy is 100% aligned with the policy of the European Union. And we have provided all the help to the Ukrainian people which are fighting for democracy and which are fighting for their right for self-determination and independent Ukrainian country which, goes to, which wants to go forward to become a member of the European Union with its own identity. The grants which we received during the winter of 80 million euros from the European Union as aid the government used to protect the citizens and their standards from the big price shocks and unpredictable autumn and winter because they were not easy. We did not leave anyone behind. We thought of everyone equally with the package of anti-crisis measures, we provided cheap electricity and smooth operation of schools, warm hospitals. We prevented the closing of companies. We protected senior and other vulnerable categories of citizens. The Social Democratic Party that leads the government nurtures and implements social democratic values. Through several packages of anti-crisis measures, we ensured an increase in the minimum wage. This year, we achieved a 100% increase of the minimum wage compared to 2016. We ensured a continuous increase in the average salary, and we also increased the pensions for the retired people. In March 2023, compared to March 2016, the average pension increased by 47%, while the minimum pension increased by 60% compared to the same period. Only with such responsible approach are the improvements possible in such a short period of time. The World Bank related, rated our efforts at providing anti-crisis support to be the highest compared to the GDP related to all the countries in our region. The European Union saw also our commitment as a government, especially in the investment for energy transformation of the country. There was no lack of support from their side, particularly for projects in the energy sector, with which I am sure will ensure an accelerated energy transformation of the country. I am pleased to say that we are the region's leader in the energy transformation. The gas interconnector with Greece which would allow our country to connect to the Trans-Adriatic gas pipeline and receive gas from other countries and not only from Russia, is anticipated to start for the construction even this year. Also at the same time, together with the European Union, together with our United States partners, and together with the government of Bulgaria, we ensured increased capacity on the existing pipelines which we have with Bulgaria. And now we could supply our country during the winter with LNG gas coming from partner countries. As Prime Minister and President of the Social Democratic Union of Macedonia, I am proud that as a leading party we turned the country towards the European agenda. 
and did not allow the progress of the country to be a victim of domestic politics. We have not allowed internal political disputes to sideline the reforms needed to approximate European Union standards and laws. This can be seen from the screening process that we started last year after adoption of the negotiation framework with the European Union. Until now, the government has made quality presentations in all chapters, and the reviews by the European Commission for the presentations so far are excellent. North Macedonia has a good percentage of compliance in the legal framework, in the adoption of laws, and will strengthen the focus in the reform of public administration, the mechanisms for the rule of law, and the fight against corruption. The screening process is taking place at the expected pace, and it is necessary to maintain the dynamics during the entire process of negotiations with the European Union. Bilateral screening will bring more impetus to reforms in our country. It is an important part of the process and confirmation that North Macedonia is moving in the right direction. We have a strong political will and a sincere desire for progress in the European integration. We also have a clear set goal, membership in the big European family by 2030. Many say that this is a very ambitious goal. I say it is not impossible. Many times I have answered when they ask me the question whether I am an optimist. And I will give you two examples. One is mine. And I am saying that I am a rational optimist. I believe in achieving a goal, and I work to achieve the goal. Or, as our fellow socialist, the Vice President of the European Commission, Joseph Borrell, would say, I am not an optimist, but I am an activist. <laughs> and. Uh, The fundamental policies, based on all previously what I said, of the government policies are stable and permanent economic growth, new investments, quality jobs, legal, social, health, and educational security. Representatives must put the achievement of common national and social goals, representatives of the people, the members of the parliament, must put the achievement of common national and social goals before political and ideological differences. The future of our citizens is above all political and ideological differences. On the occasion of the European Union membership, North Macedonia should show that it is a country that can increase the domestic capacity even more. The government will lead the process transparently, and we expect everyone to be up to the task. Most of all, I expect the Parliament to show proactive and assume its task and responsibility. Regardless of the party affiliation, members of Parliament are elected by the citizens and therefore they must show constructiveness on behalf of the citizens, as well as unity for our society. North Macedonia has the full support of our international allies for accelerating the pace of accession negotiations. As Prime Minister, I must emphasize the importance of Austria's continuous and strong support for the European integration process of my country. Our great importance for us as a country will be the help and support in reaching a national consensus for the upcoming process with the constitutional amendments. We are a new generation of politicians who bear the weight of our time and neither the steps we are taking nor the path we are walking are easy. But nothing is impossible when it comes to the citizens. For them it is very important what kind of country they live in, whether and how the rule of law works, whether the law and the laws are implemented, what kind of air they breathe, what kind of water they drink, in what kind of environment an educational system their children grow. And what size of salary they receive. It is our responsible to make 
all of this possible and all of this happen. Allow me to go back to the very beginning of my lecture. To the title of the discussion. And clearly confirm that I strongly believe that the beginning of the accession negotiations of North Macedonia with the European Union is an important moment for the European Union enlargement. As never before, there is an awareness of the importance of the expansion process of the European Union. We should use this moment and wisely and responsibly incorporate our Macedonian stone into the European mosaic of states and values. Finally, as Prime Minister and President of SDSM, which is part of the Party of European Socialists, I want to send a few messages to my colleagues, social democrats and socialists with whom we share the same values. I want to once again publicly ask all of you to continue the support you give to my country on the road to the European Union. Inside the Macedonian Assembly, a, we need a voice for Europe. We will do everything to implement all the reforms and all the steps for the European future of the country. However, in order to prevent new circumstances in the shape of new political demands, we need support within the European Union, within the European institutions, and within the European Parliament. The only factors that should be used to evaluate North Macedonia are the outcomes and the completed screening procedures and standards. I made a commitment to my citizens, to the Macedonian Parliament, and to the entire European Union, that we will, complete, that we will complete and do our homework. We firmly believe in the European future for North Macedonia and are fully committed to the fulfillment of this strategic goal. Nevertheless, that done homework must be properly verified by the European Union. The long road to have a certain end based on what has been accomplished. Nothing more, nothing less. Many Macedonian generations have grown up waiting for the date when they will become part of the European Union with the hope that they will live in their own country with European values. Therefore, it is time for results. No new obstacles, no new additions, no inhibitions, no political demands, or no new conditions. I am available to you for further questions and open discussions. want to thank once again for the opportunity to give my lecture and this prestigious Diplomatic Academy. This is my second lecture as Prime Minister after the Columbia University. This was a great pleasure. Also having some of my great former ministers educated in Vienna, as Mr. Nuredini is here, who came from Vienna to be part of my government, and now he's back to his family to Vienna. After this lecture, I will be lecturing at the John Hopkins University in the States, but it's always the biggest pleasure being here in Vienna among friends and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister, for this lecture and for the deep insights you gave us also ab not only about the accession process but also on economic benchmarks, uh, infrastructure, investments, energy issues, um, etc. Nevertheless, um, I would like to start uh, with a little bit more um, detailed uh, assessment on the next steps. <coughs> As uh, last year, um, and you mentioned it already, um, you 
um, agreed with Bulgaria on um, several steps forward. So Bulgaria um, uh, finally agreed on uh, the start of the negotiations as well. And one part of the agreement is uh, the constitutional amendment you are about to um, implement um, concerning the Bulgarian minorities. Um, so for this constitutional amendment, uh, your government needs the approval of at least parts of the conservative right-wing uh, opposition. And until now, it seems um, t that there is little room for compromise. But now there is uh, a suggestion from the conservatives um, like for a new wording of the constitutional amendments. What's, what, how do you think this will proceed and what's, um, what's your strategy to find a solution with the opposition? I will refer to two questions in my answer. First, in your question, last year we agreed with 27 member states of the European Union to start the negotiations. Because if you follow our road to start the negotiations, we were in the waiting for 17 years. So there was always something, someone every year that was blocking. Whether it was Greece, whether it was France, whether it was Bulgaria. So if some country had to make hard decisions and to wait for the start, then this is my country, North Macedonia. So we agreed last year with 27 member countries and the negotiation framework was approved by all the 27 member countries. Yesterday, one experienced Austrian journalist, a lady journalist, asked me as follows. I will paraphrase the question. That there is a veto from the opposition for the European pet. So this is the first time that the veto does not come from the outside, mm. but it comes from the inside. And that's why I re refer to these two questions. Because so far, the veto was always from some third party coming from outside. This time, the veto can come from inside the country. And that is why I am saying, the process of European integration is not a process of one person. It is not a process of one political party. This is not a process of one government. This is a process of all the society. And this is a strategic goal for the citizens and for the country. 31 years ago, 32 years ago, our citizens have created a country made a decision to have independent Republic of Macedonia that will become one day member of NATO and member of the European Union. For the younger students are, that are here, when you go in a parliament, then on the right side are sitting the conservatives, on the left side are sitting, they are saying the leftists. I'm saying, and the literature says, the progressives. All the decisions which were made in our country, all the strategic decisions were made by the progressive political parties. The independence of the country was led by President Kiro Gligorov. He has a membership card in the Social Democratic Union of Macedonia 001. The transition of the Macedonian economy from socialist to capitalist liberal economy was done by a social democratic prime minister. The entrance into NATO and making these hard decisions was done by my predecessor, the leader of the Social Democratic Union. Before him, the current vice president of the Party of European Socialists started the candidacy of the country and the activities within the Stabilization and Association Agreement. And again, the negotiations and the acceptance of the negotiation framework with the European Union started with the Social Democratic Prime Minister. So all the decisions 
were paid by social democratic prime ministers, members of parliament to whom I pay deep respect because when they are making the decision, then they are uh, in front of the public to explain all of these decisions that are made. And today, as never before, we need unity of all the political parties, no matter of their ideological background. Because this is a decision for the citizens, for the future of this generation and of the next generations. Our people deserve, as I said, I don't want to repeat myself, to live in a country member of the European Union, but to live in a country, North Macedonia, member of the European Union, and not to take the flights and to go to Austria, to Germany, to France, to Italy, to Sweden, and to work and live in the European Union. Because we know they want better standards and they want better services. And this comes with the European Union membership. The older here can remember when Macedonia was part of Yugoslavia. Compare the living standard of Macedonia at that time with the living standard of Romania, Poland, or Czechoslovakia. Incomparable. For them, our standard was several times better. And look at this today. It was unimaginable at that time that somebody from North Macedonia would go to work in Prague or in Bratislava for a better salary. After they enter the European Union, if you go to Prague, you will find the whole streets full with Macedonians which are working there for a higher salary. And that's why I'm saying that it's the responsibility of everyone to make the decisions that this country, North Macedonia, becomes member of the European Union. And this is not the last decision. Mm. Because until the final entrance in the European Union, there will be a change of the reform of the public administration. Again, two-thirds majority. Reform of the judicial system. Again, a two-third majority. Reform of the prosecution system. Two-third majority. Reform of the fiscal decentralization and functional decentralization. Two-thirds majority. These processes cannot be hostage of a career of a one person. And that's why I'm saying that I believe in the democratic, visionary, and strategic capacity of our parliament that will make the brave and the right decision by November, and that we continue the opening of the clusters, and by 2030 we become members of the European Union. Um, like a, a second obstacle that always has been there is not only like the opposition, but also, as you mentioned, other countries. and. The, rec the, the recent country uh, that, um, uh, that, uh, like imp that imposed obstacles um, on the process was Bulgaria with, with a very uncompromising attitude. Um, so we see that in Bulgaria there is no stable government. There have been snap elections for years now. I think now it's, there's going to be the sixth uh, parliamentary election in only a fifth, uh, but, but there's prob maybe going to be another one, um, which would be the sixth one. How is it for you to uh, negotiate like with a caretaker government for such a long time? Um, how, how would you describe um, the, the framework of cooperation you can, you can have in this situation? So I must say that uh, in every negotiations, if you make alone the agreement, then the agreement is always good for you. So if we draw the agreement by ourselves, then we were going to make it as we like it. But on the other side, if Bulgaria made the agreement by themselves, it was going to work only for them. And that's why there are negotiations and there is a compromise at the end of the day. What we ensured and which was not possible in the past. A clear Macedonian language and identity with all its cultural heritage, 
recognized in the European Union. And this is done. We signed the first agreement with the European Union, with our Macedonian language, without any footnotes, without any explanations, together with all the other official languages of the European Union, approved by all the 27 countries, members of the European Union. Who could have imagined only two years ago that and Greece and Bulgaria will approve this? So that's why I'm saying that on the case of North Macedonia, the power of soft diplomacy proved that it works for the identity issues. Because all the conflicts which are on the Balkans in the past and current have been identity issues. The conflict in Ukraine is an identity issue, is the same. And that's why I'm saying, and that's why from the first day we condemned the attack of Russia on Ukraine. Because every country has the right of self-determination and to decide its own citizens for the future of their country. And that's why we aligned our foreign policy with the European Union. With Bulgaria, the communication has to be through the official institutions. We have open dialogue on many issues which look at the future. So we work on infrastructure projects together, Corridor 8. We work together during the winter on the energy security. So on the first day of the energy crisis, we ensured, together with the president of Bulgaria, that there will, that there will be uninterrupted functioning of the cross-border electricity capacity, electrical capacities, which was not the case in the past. This year, it was all uninterrupted. Together with the government of Bulgaria, with the caretaker government of Mr. Donev, we agreed, together with our partners from the States and the European Union, that we will find a way to increase the pressure on the existing pipeline and to find other sources for gas supply for North Macedonia, as we were 100% dependent on Russian gas. And we did it together. So it comes, when it comes to official communication, then we can work on the future. Mm. On the other side, there are third parties which do not want to see the region integrated in the European Union. So they have made an infrastructure of media sending false news, disinformations. They are financing political parties which work against the NATO and European agenda of the region. And you can find them also in individuals which represent themselves as analyticians, influencers, and so on. And you parties, find them you also in our country, and you find them also in Bulgaria. By third parties, you mean? Political parties, yes, which are financed by Russian political parties in the country. If there is somebody who has different thesis then I, can, then I said, the public is always open. We work in a democratic society. Thank you. Yes. I'm, I'm looking around in the audience if there is uh, anybody who wants to join. Uh, many, many are. So we start here in the second row. Um, uh, yes, the microphone. And may, could you introduce yourself uh, and uh, please be brief on your question? Yes. So my name is uh, Jun Saito, a doctoral student of the University of Vienna. And at first, uh, thank you very much for quite informa informative uh, lectures. And my question is uh, regarding to the, to the uh, Euro-Atlantic path uh, mentioned by you and the authoritarian challenge uh, mentioned by Ms. Uh, Randy Wagner. So now the uh, Western Balkan is, uh, uh, has, uh, has, beca uh, has become a great game of the great powers again. And its participant is not only USA, EU, uh, but also authoritarian, authoritarian powers, Turkey, China, and last but not least, uh, Russia. And my question is, uh, has North Ma uh, Macedonia's uh, Euro-Atlantic path or European path uh, 
is challenged by uh, these authoritarian powers. And the second question is, uh, how, North, uh, how, uh, sorry, how does your uh, social democratic government of North Macedonia uh, deal with uh, these authoritarian challenges uh, to go forward the your Euro-Atlantic path? Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Mr. Kauchenberg, we, we, we take a Can second? I answer because Thank this you. was a pretty long question, or maybe I can answer, okay. maybe in combination. Okay. Huh? So uh, first, North Macedonia has always had friends from the first day of its independence. Austria is among them, one of the top friendly countries. We are one of the rare countries which has strategic dialogue and strategic cooperation with the United States of America. We have great relations with Germany, France, and all the members of the European Union. After the PRESPA agreement, one of the biggest supporters of our European Union integration is Greece. And this can be seen on every summit which we have of the European Union and with the countries of the Western Balkans. Always there are third party countries which do not want historically to see this region of Western Balkans integrated in the European Union. And I was very clear in the answer previously. What we do as a government? First, we make very clear and very transparent decisions. On the first day of the Russian attack on Ukraine, we fully aligned our foreign policy with the European Union. That's number one. Number two, we imposed all the sanctions that were done by the European Union. And number three, we provided military and non-military aid to the Ukrainian people to defend themselves. And let's not forget, North Macedonia is a member country of NATO, but we are a member country of NATO. Even that we are not the biggest country, we are a very active country in NATO. And my, I must say very positive words about our Ministry of Defense, about our Minister of Defense, about our former Minister of Defense, that did not let grass to grow over our feet at the day when we entered into NATO, but we were a very active and supportive member of the NATO alliance. Thank you. Mr. Kochberg. Um, Kochberg, Institute of the Danube region, uh, Central Europe. Um, I have a question concerning also the bilateral talks with Bulgaria. And uh, of course, there is, it's not quite equal because Bulgaria is at the same time a member of EU already and North Macedonia is not yet. Now, I just wonder if the EU can be a little bit more active in these bilateral talks as well. Um, uh, to, or that also member uh, countries are more active towards uh, Bulgaria. I'm not speaking against Bulgaria at all, but Bulgaria may be in, in its own way now, uh, hindering itself uh, unnecessarily. Uh, they, they should be happy to have another EU member uh, <laughs> at the border. So uh, I just wonder, uh, how is your opinion? Thank you. uh, I must say that uh we did a lot of uh, joint work together with the government of uh, Prime Minister Kirill Petkov. And uh, I, in the recent time after that government, I do, do not comment on the Bulgarian internal politics because there is pretty much of a changing dynamics. So Bulgaria is for a quite a long time under a caretaking government. And that is why we do not want to be part of that discussion as, you know, country which is constantly in elections. Everything is used by the political parties in the country to get a vote plus. And that is why we do not comment on the internal political dynamics in Bulgaria. But what I can say is only to, to repeat what I, what I said at the beginning and on, on two other occasions. We have a very clear negotiation framework with the European Union with the European Union, where North Macedonia is evaluated based on the criteria which are stipulated for entering in the European Union. The bilateral questions with Bulgaria are part of our bilateral agreement, and they are not criteria for entrance in the European Union. So there is a formed, for, let's say, for historical questions, there is a historical commission. This historical commission is comprom com is comprising of historicians, seven from Bulgaria, seven from North Macedonia, and then decide 
on a consensus base. So they can agree on something only if 14 historians agree. If there is one who is not agreeing, there is no agreement. When this has been agreed for some issues, then on a reciprocal basis, based on countries' procedures, only on reciprocal basis, it can be implemented in the both countries. And this is very clearly agreed. So there are many countries that still have historical commissions which are working between themselves, even between member countries in the European Union. Also with Greece, we have a historical commission which works. They had zero meetings last year. But you see, when there is an agreement on a high political level, and when the rhetorics between the politicians works for the future, then the relations between the ordinary citizens become more relaxed. Then the businesses connect. Then the economy improves and the trade improves. I will give you one comparison. We created the Open Balkans Initiative in the, between North Macedonia, Serbia, and Albania. We are also part of the Berlin process. And we are very supportive of the Berlin process. And we are very active in the Berlin process as a country. And the latest agreements signed in the Berlin process are deposited in our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And just last week, we ratified the agreements which we signed. But when we see the economic parameters of the Open Balkan, because the Open Balkan is an organic, original initiatives of the three countries, where the activities are done based on an agreed consensus. Green lines for the trade, uh, decreased non-tariff barriers and procedures on the borders. The trade between the three countries in the last two years increased for 25%. The export from North Macedonia to Serbia increased by 50%. The export from North Macedonia to Albania increased by 40%. The numbers of tourists coming from Serbia to North Macedonia. 2022, 2021 versus 2020 increased for 200%. The number of tur- 200%. The number of tourists in 2022 versus 2021 from Serbia coming to North Macedonia increased for 500%. So when you have a political agreement And when you do not talk about the past, because, you know, for a politician, it's easiest to talk about the past. Because then you don't promise anything when you talk about the past. You are just fooling around the citizens about the past. You know, there is one sentence which I said. In my country, we have two concepts. One concept is the concept of European Macedonia. Political parties, led by my political party, by our partner, biggest Albanian coalition partner, Dui, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, and so on, that we want to see the country as member of the European Union to do the necessary reforms. And on the other side are the political parties which want to see again the country isolated with a false patriotism. And you know what they are promising to the people? They are promising to the people that they are going to be heated in the winter. They provide them this patriotic heat, false patriotic heat, and people are not noticing that their shoes and feet are burning. And this was happening to our country for 11 years. Not moving one millimeter in European integration. As a government, we inherited a minimum wage, I will tell you an absolute amount, of 8,000 dinners. Today, the minimum wage is 20,750 dinners. So just compare the absolute amount. You don't need the foreign exchange rate. May I briefly follow up on the Open Balkans, as you mentioned it? Uh, this is... Le- 
foreseen as sort of a mini Schengen in the in the region where you can um, travel easily and uh, without borders. So and part of this Open Balkans project is uh, Serbia, Albania, and uh, North Macedonia. But there are still three countries that are not part of um, the o Open Balkans initiative: Kosovo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Montenegro. Do you uh, do you have any hopes that? Uh, it will be possible to, um, uh, like, to convince the other countries to join as well. Or, and do you think this is um, compatible, even like with the EU enlargement? First of all, uh, the Open Balkan Initiative, as I said, is organic initiative and original, which come, which came out of the uh, three countries, which are which are in the same region. It is no replacement for Euro integration and it is not replacement for the Berlin process. It is open for all the countries in the region and for Kosovo and for Borussia and Herzegovina and for Montenegro. I have also invited to join Italy, Greece, Turkey. Why? Because the Open Balkan Initiative is not a political initiative. It is an initiative which is based on the four freedoms of Europe. Free flow of people, goods, services, and capital. And the numbers which I mentioned exactly prove this. Because all the meetings and summits of the Open Balkan are open for the public. And there you can see that only economic issues are discussed. This year, on the biggest wine festival in Vin Italy, in Verona, we went as three countries. First of all, if we went by ourselves, who knows if our wine producers were going to be able to pay the stand there. Second, even if we went with three separate stands, they were going to be small stands. But we had the big open Balkan wine vision stand, one of the biggest there. So when you are together, then you are stronger. Or let's put the other word, stronger, we are together. And I want to make one remark, which I made in Italy on the press conference. There is, or the borders on the Balkans are the most idiotic things, thing which I can imagine. We were the only countries that didn't have borders in Europe. And now, we are the only countries that have borders in Europe. So when you go north of Serbia on Horgos, up to Scandinavia, there are no borders. When you go on Shid west towards Croatia, there are no borders to Lisbon. The only borders are on the Balkans. 70% of the transport on the Balkans, based on the data of the World Bank, is waiting on the borders, not driving. 70% is waiting on the borders. And that's why I said, I'm going to do everything to make a day without borders on the Balkans, to see whether we will survive. <laughs> I have so many more questions, and I also saw that in the audience. I can come again if you. You have to come again, but, <laughs> yes. but let me just but because our time is over now. But let me just uh, like close this event with one question, because we we always talk and uh, we talk, talk about what the EU demands from the Western Balkans countries, which reforms need to be implemented, and so on. But do you? We never talk about like the. Uh, region's perspective, the Western Balkans' perspective on the EU, what do you think, what kind of reforms should uh, the EU implement uh, in order to develop in a prosperous and progressive way? First, uh, I do not see the requests of the European Union for reforms as demands, but I see them as necessity for improvement of our societies and countries, by any sense judicial system, rule of law, education, health, all the systems, to improve them step by step in order to come to a level to European Union member country. 
what the European Union can do. First, bigger presence in the region. Because if you leave space, somebody else will fill it in. And this was done in the past years. In the last decade, when the European Union didn't have a clear strategy on the, European, on the Western Balkans integration, then we saw what happened. An infrastructure of third countries, which do not want to see the region in the European Union was built. Media, political parties, individuals. And now it's clear for everyone in Brussels. Second thing, the European funds. If you see the European funds per capita for the European member countries, then, and the funds which are available to the Western Balkans, then what a European Union member country receives is 10 times or even more higher than a candidate country. With this, the economic gap is increasing between the member countries and the candidate countries. And what is the result? The result is that more people want to go to work in the European Union. And that's why I'm saying more funds, faster integration, bigger focus. And then by 2030, to have the region integrated in the European Union. Because let's not forget, the infrastructure now will go through the Western Balkans. And the, strong, the stronger we will become if we are all together. Because the Western Balkans is imminent part of the European Union. It's a natural part of the European Union. And it will be like that one day. Thank you. Thank you very much. And apologies to everybody who um, didn't have the chance now to, to ask a question. Many thanks to you, Mr. Prime Minister, for your Thank insightful you. and frank remarks. Let me wish you all the best to you and your country. And yeah, let us hope that the accession talks with North Macedonia can resume as soon as possible and there won't be another they will continue. on the way. Thank you also to the Diplomatic Let's Academy, to the Ambassador Briggs and to René Schlee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.